It's our pleasure today to bring Merlin Nichols to our studios at Peace FM Chat TV. Welcome, Merlin. Oh, thank you very much. It's good we're, to be here. Yeah, we're drinking uh, spiced uh, apple tea. And as this is good. It is good, and it, it's going to make an excellent show. I have a lot of questions for Merlin because Merlin uh, is bringing to our studio and bringing to the Peace Country his um, books, plus his also your philosophy and your background. It's a big contribution to our society. One of the things that when I first read uh, Merlin's book, uh, Between Rivers, my misconception was Between Rivers. If you don't know Merlin, Merlin lives on Jackfish Lake Road and to the north is the Peace River and to the east is the Pine. And to the west is the Moberly. The Moberly. So it's Between Rivers. Indeed. But that isn't the reason why you named your book Between Rivers, or is it? No, the rivers that we are between are the river Styx and the river of life. Now, I, actually, I live between rivers, and I don't know if that thought ever crossed my mind, but it's the Styx and the life. And if you get the uh, hardcover uh, edition, you'll see in the flyleaf, the first flyleaf is mm -hmm. talks about the river Styx, and the back flyleaf is the river of life. That's interesting. And Can you tell a little? Between rivers. Yeah. Can you tell a little bit of the river Styx? Yes, and I hope never to see it. Mm -hmm. The river Styx is a, is a mythological river. The ancients believed, or some of the ancients believed, that uh, when you died, a fellow named Shunrel, he had a long greasy beard, uh, he took you across the river Styx into Never Never Land, you know, the land where you'd never return from, uh, in death. You know, in mythology there were some people who tried to go there, one of them to uh, rescue his uh, his dead lover, but uh, he never succeeded. Because once you go beyond the river Styx, you're, you're gone. Well, it's very, very interesting you chose that, but your entire book refers to the Lord's Prayer. Was that intentional? How did that develop? Well, certainly that was intentional. Mm -hmm. um, what, I, what I try to do here, what I have done here, is um, build the story of, you might say, the story of your lives, our lives, mm -hmm. as we exist between these two rivers within the framework of the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. For example, the, uh, the, the, the prayer opens with our Father mm -hmm. in Heaven. So, our Father in Heaven, He's our Creator, He's our Father, He's our Redeemer, but He's what, what I emphasize in the first uh, chapters is the father aspect. So I'm describing the father and my relationships with my father to illustrate uh, the father aspect of our father. Mm -hmm. But then we have the hour. So our, as I illustrate in the book, begins with, in the English language at least, begins with the letter O. Mm -hmm. And the O is essentially a circle. Mm -hmm. So you have a circle. And uh, we can make it as big or as small as we like. Mm -hmm. If you, if you know, the, if you're generous of heart and and uh, open and inclusive, you make a very large circle. And anyone that wants to come into it, I suppose within reason, mm -hmm. is invited in and welcomed into this circle, which and and introduced, of course, to our Father, because if, if it's ours, then it's yours, it's mine, it's yours, it's yours. It's ours, yeah. and that's that's why we have the our in our Father. Yeah. I think it's intentional. Oh, of course it's intentional, but I think it took you probably a few hours to think of that, to, and as you plotted out the book, every chapter deals with one part of our Lord's Prayer. Yes. And, and I think that's amazing. Also, can you comment on this book, Between Rivers, is a lot different from this book in that it's more poetic. Did you have fun writing Between Rivers? <laughs> I had fun writing both of them. Um, so, some sections, it doesn't seem to make any difference which book. Mm -hmm. Some sections I just grind away and I grind and grind and grind and it, it's just a chore. And in other places it seems to flow. Yeah, chapter three, when I read chapter three, 
it was very poetic. I, I thought I was reading poetry at one point, which I found really very good. Um, you're a poet. I didn't know it. You haven't read my poetry yet. <laughs> oh, I'll have to read that. Well, this is poetic, Between Rivers. Okay, so Between Rivers, there's one phrase that you explained to me, and it's confessions of the slow learner. Mm -hmm. When I read it, I said, he's not a slow learner. He's a fast learner. You were uh, the principal of a college. You taught. You do some pastoring. You're not a slow learner. But you turned around and looked me in the eye and said, yes, you were. Explain your concept of being a slow learner. Well, typically, a slow learner is thought of as one who, you know, gets stood in the corner in school. And, yeah, I was and that student. I've stood in the corner in school. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but the slow learning aspect of each of these books is that it took me half a century to come to understand the concepts that, are, uh, that I'm presenting here. You know, in, in The Long Road to Grace, we, you know, God has created us and he has promised us a home at the river of life, but too many of us think we have to work our way to get there. You know, it's, it's sweat and blood and tears and then if you can't reach high enough, well, you're just out of luck. But that's wrong. It doesn't work that way. You'll never be good enough. So it's, it's, it's grace. And if it takes me 50 years or 60 years to learn that, that's the long road. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm a slow. That's why I expressed uh, myself as a slow learner. Yeah. So both both books cover the same period. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I appreciated after you told me the concept of the slow learner um, because uh, yeah, it, it's it's a good riddle, and uh, that's important. Now, growing up in Jackfish Lake Road, you came from Saskatchewan as a toddler. No, not quite as a toddler. Oh, I was uh, born? nine years old or something. Oh, yeah, you're a little bit older. Yeah. You really loved living at Jackfish. Oh, indeed. Home. You were trying to portray yourself in the uh, Between Rivers as being a little bit of a bad boy. Uh, like there's one sentence there, you take your gun and go off into the pass, into the wilderness. You did that, I gather, a couple times. Say that again to me? Well, in, in Between Rivers, you, you talked about uh, um, growing up and putting on your taking 22 and going off into the oh, and shooting the shooting the chipmunk yeah 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 that wasn't nice yeah, <laughs> yeah. poor chipmunk no, yeah. I, I mean as soon as they picked up that little corpse you know I just had this terrible feeling this, mm -hmm. this is this is not nice this is awful yeah this is wicked yeah I mean you just go around shooting chipmunks yeah just because you got a gun yeah you know? yeah I was touched by that Going back to the concept of Jackfish Lake Road, there's not very many authors on the road, are there? Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, there is another. There's Mrs. Pruckle. Yeah. Mrs. Pruckle. Yeah. So you guys, yeah, it's kind of neat that there's people on the road that in a sort of a wilderness area, far away from everything, have written books. But what is one of the most inspirational things of your growing up? D did you do homeschooling? <laughs> Actually, uh, I was in... I finished grade four by the time we got there. Yep. We started school in Saskatchewan, of course. Yep. I was a pretty fluent reader before I went to school. Mm -hmm. And it got me into a lot of trouble. Why is that? Well, I was, I, I sort of flaunted it. Oh. So on the way home from school, you know, I was many times I come home with a bloody nose. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, that's part of the slow learning, you know. Yeah. When you said that you, you got into trouble, I thought maybe you didn't return your library books on time. Did, oh. Was there a library or how did you get all your books? Because you're, you're very literate and you told me that you read a lot, even in the wilderness. Well, of course. Um, we were, uh, British Columbia was very foresighted in, in providing a library situated in Victoria yeah and uh, we could every six weeks we could send in an order for six or eight or ten books ah. and uh, postage paid both ways yep so we'd get this package of books this thick and read them and send them back with another order uh -huh. so we, we we read books continuously Wow that's really incredible that's very thankful for oh, a government to think of that indeed and you mentioned your own dad and 
your wife's dad. No, they were, yeah, all right. Yeah, your wife's dad. They were inspirational to you also. Oh, yes, and my dad was very, he was very resourceful. Um, he wanted to bring a picture. I, I don't have a real picture of my dad. Okay, but you can talk about it. Um, my dad came from a, from a family of, uh, you might say, modern day pioneers. When I went to university in the States, I, um, my focus was history. <laughs> And uh, I studied what they called the frontier theory of... Um, I know very, very well. You know that one? Yes, yes. I was an honor student in history, too. Okay. So I know the frontier. You know the frontier theory. Yeah. So that theory means that, that the frontier had a, had a powerful effect on developing the culture of, uh, of the country. And uh, as, as the frontier proceeded across the continent, the, the culture developed with it. In 1890, uh, it was declared that the last frontier in the United States had disappeared. Not so here in Canada. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, the Peace River country started to be settled probably about 100 years ago now, mm -hmm. seriously settled by the European, Canadian, yep. American settlers. Yep. And they came from the east and from the south. A lot of Americans migrated north, a lot of Canadians migrated west, and my, my parents, is, it, they, they're, they're rather interesting. My grandparents had, uh, with their family, lived uh, in Agassiz at the turn of the uh, uh, 1899 to 1900. And uh, then they moved from Agassiz back to the prairies wow. in Saskatchewan where the land was cheap. Yeah. And from the prairies in Saskatchewan in 1918, they moved north into the wilderness country of northern Saskatchewan. Yeah. And when that got too populated, they moved out here. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting. When you first came at age nine, it was really, really rough. Wasn't it just trees and rocks? I mean, when we moved out there? Yeah. Or there were homes there, but you guys built your own home. There you? were no homes out there when we moved to nope. nothing. Nothing. No. Just there trees. was no there was no road out there. Just trees and rocks and potential. Not much for rock. Just trees and mud. Mm. Muskeg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in order to get there, my folks had to cut this road through the wilderness. And there was a, there had been a wagon trail out there mm -hmm. all the way to the Peace River, but it wasn't possible even for horses most of the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it took a, two or three years for them to get a road that was accessible to vehicles. I remember when some of my American relatives came to visit us in, what year would it have been, 56, I think? Mm -hmm. Maybe it was 55. 55, they had to stop their car about four miles south of our home, and we came down and picked them up with the horses. I mean, yeah. as, as late as 55. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's really, really interesting. So you went to the university off in? I, I, I've actually attended four universities. Oh, wow. Four, yeah, four of them. Which had named them? I finished up at the University of British Columbia. Yeah, UBC, yeah. Uh, Andrews University in Michigan, mm -hmm. Walla Walla University in Washington, and, and uh, La Sierra in California. Wow. One of the stories I really like, and I'm not sure where you got it, but I would like you to tell the story. It's about Moshi and the Pope. And I, this is a really good story. I've told it now to about a dozen people, and they just are amazed. They love it. <laughs> I'd rather read it. Read it. Yep. Sorry. Moshi and the Pope. Actually, this is in the uh, in chapter 11. Yep. Under the language of hallowing, you say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Mm -hmm. yep. So, this has to do with hallowing uh, by the language we use. So, uh, you put on your specs. <laughs> yes. Oh, I think you asked me earlier about uh, homeschooling or correspondence. Yeah. yeah. I didn't get to answer that one. No. Do you want an answer? Yeah, before we hear about Moshe and the Pope. Before? Before. Wait, we started it. So yes, 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 yes. Well, actually, when we moved out here, there was no there was no school in Chetland then, and certainly there was no school there out in the bush. Yeah. So uh, my folks 
got us correspondence. I started my grade five by correspondence. It was summertime. We were living in a tent. And I remember getting this big package of stuff and it was so exciting. You know, I crawled back in the tent, the sun was shining. It's warm and cozy and I opened it and pulled out lesson this and lesson that social studies and arithmetic and reading and spelling. And yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. That was grade five. Just recently, I was looking through some of my old records and I found my certificate for, for completing my elementary schooling. And I found it took me 36 months to get through grade five. Is that a record? <laughs> it could be a record. <laughs> that's not three years, that's 36 Six months. months. Yeah. yeah. So, and it doesn't bode well for your future. <laughs> well, it, it must, you must have enjoyed it. Well, actually, I wasn't spending too much time on it. We'd be out trapping squirrels or skipping logs or playing yeah. in the snow or swimming in the yeah. river lake or whatever, anything but school. Yeah. And then when, why, why have school when you read books? Yep, yeah. that's right. Anyway, 36 bucks. So my relatives in California invited me to come down there for my grade nine. So that put a real incentive took me about two months to finish grade eight. <laughs> so that was a record. That was a record. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to hear Mushi and the Pope, and this is a really good story. Uh, I loved it. All right. Language and communication are not simple matters. Words alone are powerful carriers of our thoughts and sentiments, or perhaps they give evidence of the lack of thought and the paucity of reflection. We need to consider carefully the words we use. Let's start with the legend of Moishi and the Pope. Moishi was a janitor who lived during one of those periods when the Jews were about to be expelled from Rome. He rose to the surface like cream on fresh milk when no one else was willing to take the risks. This is how I remember the story. The Pope had issued an order requiring all Jews in Rome to leave the city by a certain date. This threw the Jews into consternation because no one wanted to give up to walk away from everything dear and familiar. Finally, someone suggested a plan. Get the Pope to debate the question with the Jews. If the Pope loses the debate, the Jews would stay. If the Jews lose the debate, they would obey the Pope's decree without further protest. Strangely, the Pope agreed. But to the further consternation of the Jews, they could find no one among their many learned scholars and erudite rabbis willing to take on the Pope. Finally, Moishi stepped forward. He would debate the Pope on one condition, he said. The debate would be carried on in complete silence. Surprisingly, the Pope agreed again, and a date was set for the great encounter. When the hour of the debate arrived, Moishi and his, and his Holiness were facing each other across a polished ebony table in an ornate meeting room. Invited guests of the Catholic hierarchy and Jewish community leaders were quietly observing. Silence filled the room and drilled into the ears of all the watchers. Only Moishi seemed totally at ease. The Pope was the first to communicate. Three fingers of his right hand drew <clears throat> watching eyes toward the arched and frescoed ceiling. Without hesitation, Moishi responded emphatically with his left forefinger. After some minutes of profound thought during which the watchers scarcely breathed, the Pope, with his jeweled right hand, drew a graceful circle in the air above his head. Again, Moishi had an immediate response, a single unadorned finger stabbed toward the marble floor. One could almost see the Pope's mind working. Moishi sat in relaxed attention, waiting for the Pope's next argument. Finally, the Pope took from a beautifully crafted red leather bag a bottle of aged wine and a wafer and placed them reverently on the table in front of him. Moishi retorted with an apple on the table. <coughs> the Pope leaped to his feet, both hands high above his mitered head, exclaiming, I quit, I give up. This man is too good for me. The Jews can stay. 
the cardinals and bishops who had gathered to witness the defeat of the Jews, pressed around the Pope looking for answers. What did you say? How could you have lost? said the Pope in a tone of deepest admiration. For every argument I presented, he had an answer. He was just too smart for me. When I held up three fingers to represent the Trinity, he responded, even so, we have just one Father, as both religions believe. When I drew in the circle in the air to show him that our Father is everywhere, he responded, true, but he is also here with us right now. <laughs> then I took out the wine and the wafer, demonstrating that our sins can be forgiven. With the apple, he reminded me of original sin. That man is just too good. He had an answer for everything I said. The Jews will stay. Meanwhile, the Jews pressed around Moishi to find out how he had managed to best the Pope in an open and fair debate. Well, said Moishi thoughtfully, when the Pope raised three fingers to tell me that the Jews had three days to get out of Rome, I told him that not one of us would leave. When he waved his hand to show me that Rome was to be swept clean of Jews, I told him we would be staying right here. And then asked a breathless woman on the fringe of the crowd. I'm not sure. Moishi hesitated. When, I took, when he took out his lunch, I took out mine. So much for language without words. Amazing, hey? Where did you hear that? Do you remember? I have no idea where I heard it. It's a wonderful story. I don't know that I, I may have seen it somewhere. But uh, it's hearing, good though, isn't it? I, I don't know. I think it reflects the whole concept of what you were talking about, language, and also different interpretations of the same thing. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. There's a couple other things that I was going to ask you about. Um, you mentioned a little Roman boy and harmony. And that's interesting because it also follows one of the uh, parts, components of the Lord's Prayer. Could you comment on that? You brought it in, actually, the, the, the poem that you brought. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I guess the whole point here in the little Roman boy in the two mm -hmm. pictures is that uh, we become what we allow our minds to think on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the, the lesson is guard your minds. You've got the keys to your minds, so don't let somebody else manipulate you. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Yeah, let's, let's hear a little bit about it. Just, you don't have, just read the first part maybe, because it's quite a long poem. It's, it's, it's up to you. It's quite long. Yeah, but go ahead, go ahead. I enjoyed it actually. Actually, it finishes up right here. Yeah, yeah, read the poem. Two pictures hung on the dingy wall of a grand old Florentine hall. One of a child of beauty rare with the cherub face and golden hair. The lovely look of whose radiant eyes filled the soul with thoughts of paradise. The other was a visage vile marked with the lines of lust and guile. A loathsome being whose features fell brought to the soul weird thoughts of hell. So you have these two pictures. Mm -hmm. One of a beautiful little boy, pure, um, hopeful, promise-filled, and the other of a desperate creature whose life has been ruined. Now, just the last. Mm -hmm. this, this artist searched for a lifetime to find somebody that would show the opposite. Mm -hmm. He found this, the, the, he found the opposite in a dungeon. Through, <clears throat> through haunts of vice in the night he stayed to find some ruin that crime had made. At last in a prison cell he caught a glimpse of the hideous fiend he sought. On a canvas weird and wild but grand he painted the face with a master hand. His task was done. It was a work sublime, an angel of joy and a fiend of crime, a lesson of life from the wrecks of time. O oh, crime with ruin, thy road is strewn, the brightest beauty the world has known, thy power is wasted, till in the mind no trace of its presence is left behind. 
The loathsome wretch in the dungeon low with a face of a fiend and a look of woe. Ruined by revels of crime and sin, a pitiful wreck of what might have been. Hated and shunned and without a home was the child that played in the streets of Rome. Excellent, really well done. Well, as we're coming close to the end, it's very interesting that you wrote both books. You were the mayor for how many years? Six years? Seven. Seven years. You were a councillor for how long? Ten. Ten years. And you were, and you, during that time, you went on two or three or four trips to Europe? At least. Yeah. You went, and where did you go to build homes? Haiti? Honduras. Honduras. Oh, Haiti, Honduras, okay. Turkey. And you were still able to do that. How can you explain that? Did you sleep at all? Yes. It's incredible that but you I were able to do all of this. I didn't waste a lot of time. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I have done at least one round the clock, wow. non-stop, to, to meet a deadline. Wow. And you're a young man. Oh, absolutely, I'm young. Yeah. How old are you, by the way? I don't know. 51? 49? What? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really incredible that a person in our community has gone this far. Um, so we thank you. And uh, I still want to say that Between Rivers is an incredible book. And uh, I liked how you related the uh, Lord's Prayer throughout chapter by chapter. And I would say it's uh, um, interesting. Now, how would you characterize yourself as a writer? Like, some are outdoor journalists, etc. How would you categorize yourself, or you don't want to even go there? I'm not sure I've given that any thought. Think about I? it. Um, someone asked me, what does he write? How would you put a category? And I would say it's really difficult because you're kind of slippery. You write Christian books, you're inspirational, and you're positive. Would you agree? I think these are positive. Yep. Do you think they're inspirational? I believe I would they're. hope so. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's quite incredible. What motivated you to, to write two inspirational, aspiring books? I, I guess I wrote them for myself. Really? Yeah. Um, Between little breaks, like mayor contests, alderman contests, flying around the world? I started, actually, I started writing. The first writing I did would have been something like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote a number of short essays, quite a number of short essays, yeah. which didn't go anywhere. I just yeah. kept them in the file. And some of them happened to be in, in here. Mm. Um, the, the book is laid out in sections, mm -hmm. as you will notice here, yep. or parts. Part one, um, joined by the creator. So part each part, is introduced by one of these short essays, followed by the uh, the chapters that are uh, built around the Lord's Prayer. So the short essays are uh, well. Here we find one. Here's part nine. Uh, yes, part nine. The three P's of evil, and if you will, get up. So here, here's the essay, just very short, yeah. and it's uh, this one's straight out of the Bible, although many of them are not. Mm -hmm. This one's the story Jesus meets this this uh, cripple and says, "Do you want to get up? Do you want to be well?" And uh, so I, I sort of build on that. It's uh, yeah, I really like that. Is there any one part of the Bible that you look at more so than any other book? Yes, the there is. What is it? Ephesians. Ephesians in the Lord's. Yeah, you told me that many years ago, actually, about three years ago. Why is Ephesians such an inspirational chapter in the Bible? It's powerful. Okay. I've memorized Ephesians. Wow. I won't repeat it for you here, no. but... <laughs> no, we can have a two-hour show, three-hour show. <laughs> but yeah, it is powerful. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on, the, on that uh, in a couple of weeks. Where are you speaking? Out at our... At the church. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's very, very interesting. Anything but, else? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, this, this book came out second. It was actually written first. Really? Really. So, and then somehow, before I polished it off, I got started on this. 
on the long road and I wrote that and, and published it and then came back to Between Rivers, settled on a title. Um, Errol Palapani actually designed the cover page and um, we, um, we polished it off and put it together last year. Mm. I think it's a very personal book too, isn't it? Oh, Incredibly. Yes. They both are. Yeah, I liked what you talk about your your wife's dad. So you oh. knew him well. He was a Finn, right? He was a Finn, yeah. I mean, we didn't get to talk about them at all, really. No. He was also a very a resourceful man. He's he was uh, he was in the Finnish Air Force during World War II, uh -huh. and uh, his plane was he crashed at least once in Germany. He was a POW. No, uh, hmm. Finland and Germany were yes, allies. That's right. that's right, yeah. Um, but he rebuilt his plane and flew it back home. And then after the war, actually in 51, the whole family came over to Canada, mm -hmm. set up in Toronto and then Montreal. And his aim was to get to Vancouver. And he was, he was a, he loved the water. And uh, he loved the sauna. And every place he settled, he'd build a sauna and find a way, his way to uh, the lakes. He'd have a boat and a trailer, and mm -hmm. he just could, would not stay away from the water. Wow. So when he finally got to Vancouver, oh my, this would have been in 60, maybe 65, 64, 65. Yeah. They found themselves a, a place out on Pitt Lake and built their summer home. And, he was happy. Excellent. So you had a lot of father images that were actual human people that helped you along. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, that's really, really, and you met your wife in Vancouver, I gather. Right. My dad was, um, he, for the last 15 years of his life, he was, he was uh, an invalid. He, was, he had a brain tumor, and he was in the hospital in Vancouver, and I went down to see him, and that's where I met my wife. Excellent. Well, what other parts that I, did I miss anything in the long road of grace in between rivers and closing? Um, actually, I think I like the closing chapters of each. Uh, particularly, <clears throat> I guess, I, the, uh, the long road. Is this, this is actually telling about. That's page 260, 261. Yeah. The river of life. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. That's, I find this one of the most inspiring. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming here. You're welcome. Um, I enjoyed it. it. When we said it was going to be a one hour show, I think we've done well. We've served both books well and I encourage everyone to come in and uh, get your personal copy from P Pine Tree Books or for Call Merlin or you'll see them on the streets or in one of our restaurants. That's where I saw you last to plan this interview. So thank you very much and I'll give you a couple uh, apple ciders to take home for your wife and whoever visits. She'll enjoy it. I'll enjoy it. I always enjoyed it. It spruces up my day. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.